guess I'll start over here, more formal. Thank you for the invite. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I was excited to get an email invitation. Typical American, I just replied, sure, I'll show up. Um, uh, but it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's all inspiring to see the pictures on the wall and the history. It reminds one that, that there's always someone who's come before you and it's always, there's always be someone who comes after you. And you're just trying to make it a little bit better as you pass through. Um, I'm going to talk tonight a little bit about the uh, counsel to the president, what that is, what it's not, uh, the history of it, that sort of thing. And then I think I'll sit down and take some hopefully uh, not so probing questions. <laughs> the counsel to the president uh, is not a position created by a statute or a law. It's something that was created first and foremost by the president. It goes back to 1943. Uh, the first uh, White House counsel was a fellow named Samuel uh, Rosenman. He had been an assemblyman in the state of New York, an elected official for a number of years, and then a, a trial judge. And President Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, asked him to come in and be his uh, counsel. He was actually more of a speechwriter. He's the person who coined the, t the term New Deal and wrote many of FDR's most uh, consequential speeches. A prime responsibility of the counsel to the president in the early years of the job was actually speechwriter. This continued for many, many years. President Kennedy's counsel was also his speechwriter, Ted Sorensen. So the counsel seemed to be not so much the lawyer, but the well-reasoned uh, well scribe who could, who could give life to what the president uh, wanted to say. This made sense because the legal work for the U.S. government was not really done within the White House. It was done at the United States Department of Justice. It's an agency that really has only been around for about 100 years. It's not something that America had in its infancy. Uh, in fact, uh, one looks through the history of political scandal, something that I know a little bit about for my many years of representing politicians. Uh, the, the first big one uh, was the Teapot Dome scandal under President Harding, and uh, the Congress commissioned the Secret Service, which then, were, they were not really the guards of the president, they, they worked, at the, they were the Department of Treasury agents uh, that, that did certain kinds of financial crime. Uh, Congress authorized them to investigate the corruption, and they were the, actually the, the law enforcement agency that, that got to the bottom of that scandal. Department of Justice didn't really emerge until later. Uh, it's only been the past hundred years, but they are seen much more as the legal, uh, institutional legal advisors to the executive branch. If the executive branch, the U.S. government has to appear before the U.S. Supreme Court, that's not what the counsel to the president does. The Solicitor General to the United States does that. Currently, that's a fellow named Noel Francisco, who I practiced law with at Jones Day before uh, becoming counsel to the president. Uh, lawsuits and that sort of thing are handled by the Department of Justice. There's an office within the Department of Justice called the Office of Legal Counsel. This was created by executive order originally. Now it's a Senate confirmed slot in our government. And this person is, is per executive order of the president, the final legal word for the executive branch. Uh, this office has been habit, inhabited by people with last names like Rehnquist and Scalia and, and people who go on to the Supreme Court. So it's sort of the brightest of the bright. Uh, work in the Office of Legal Counsel. Over, th over time, however, the historical role of DOJ has become one of increasing independence from the presidency. Um, this really began in earnest uh, in the mid-1970s uh, with the series of scandals labeled under the broad rubric of Watergate, which began as a, as a break-in to a, the opposition party's headquarters, which uncovered uh, slush funds, hush money, payments to the burglars and all sorts of sundry things. Um, the White House counsel at the time, uh, John Dean, uh, was involved, to, to, depending on who you believe, to varying degrees. I'm not going to get into the, the history. Uh, but that is really sort of the seminal break in the White House counsel being more of a counselor, speechwriter. Uh, Dean had developed an expertise in ethics. There was a number of new ethics laws, financial disclosure forms had to be filed. Uh, he developed a specialty in that, but he, he was a, a young lawyer who worked on Capitol Hill uh, for a number of years, good lawyer, but uh, uh, was not a sort of an elder statesman of the Washington, D.C. legal uh, bar. Um, this began to change a little bit uh, after Watergate and changed uh, significantly really in the 1980s um, with maybe a four-year transition during the Carter years. 
where DOJ became increasingly independent of the White House uh, and became more uh, uh, of its own, uh, had its own, its own way of thinking. The counsel to the president then, in a, in a way, filled that void. So many things that I did on a day-to-day -day basis as counsel to the president 50 years ago would have been done by the attorney general. Um, and certainly six, 60 years ago would have been done by the attorney general. Um, uh, and that's just the natural evolution. So what does the counsel to the president do? Well, I think it's easier to state it in the negative up front. What he does not do, he doesn't represent the president in the president's personal capacity. Um, this was something that White House counsels prior to Watergate kind of thought they did. Um, there really was not a need to test the issue, but post Watergate it became clear and the ABA, or American Bar Association, passed some ethics rules inspired by Watergate regarding uh, who is the client. You see this more in the corporate world where a lawyer represents the corporate entity, not the CEO, does not re represent individual board members, they represent the company. The same is true of counsel to the president. I like to say I represent the pictures on the wall. Um, I represent, represented the, the powers of the presidency, not the man, but the office. Um, always a challenge, and this is a challenge I had throughout my career, having represented a number of members of the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate and governors. What role one plays as a lawyer? Are you a personal counsel? Are you representing their personal interests? Are you giving them ethics advice as a, as a, as a professional government lawyer? Are you representing them, giving them advice on their constitutional authority? It's very, it's very uh, challenging to keep them straight, and it's really the lawyer's job to keep them straight for the client. You don't expect the client to do it. That's why you have the White House counsel. Um, other things the White House counsel does in addition to ethics uh, is uh, help the various White House staff with their ethics. There's a number of forms one must file to work in the government in the United States. You must disclose uh, virtually all of your finances, anything that can pose a conflict of interest, that sort of thing. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, pardons, people want pardons or commutations of their sentences. That uh, originates sometimes in the Department of Justice. It doesn't have to. The pardon power is, is vested with the president in the text of the Constitution. This is actually a throwback uh, to when we were part of you, uh, to the powers of the crown. Um, and uh, that's something that the counsel to the president uh, reviews and makes recommendations on. Um, uh, the prime uh, focus, however, though, was on separation of powers, the role of the presidency versus the role of the legislature in the Congress and the Senate, and then what's subject to judicial review. So the, the expertise I had to develop quickly uh, was, was presidential authority. Sometimes people would say that the counsel to the president represents the people. It's partially correct, doesn't quite tell the whole story. I thought of myself as representing Article 2 of our Constitution, which is where the presidency is found. Article 1 is the legislature, Article 3 are the judges. There's these other articles, 4 and 5, no one reads those much. Um, but for separation of powers, it's 1, 2, and 3 are the ones to know. Um, the other uh, thing that I had, a, two things uh, uh, before we turn to questions that I, I had quite a bit to do with was judicial selection under the U.S. Constitution, the president nominates uh, judges and with the advice and consent of the Senate appoints judges. So uh, they go through Senate confirmation. Some of these are televised in rather spectacular ways. All are televised in some way. Uh, C-SPAN is the channel we use that cover legislative uh, uh, hearings um, and uh, that became quite contentious at times. So I had quite a bit to do with uh, the good, the bad and the ugly on those. Um, the thing I'm probably most proud of as far as a legacy thing was the, the opportunity the president gave me to be a part of that. Um, uh, while I was counsel to the president, the president appointed two Supreme Court justices of, of, of a nine-member court, uh, one of whom actually uh, studied here at Oxford and received a doctorate in, in philosophy. Um, very appealing to have a Supreme Court justice who really has taken time to study the origins of law, what it means, the philosophy behind it. Uh, and the like. Uh, oftentimes, people just become lawyers, they don't really do the deep, deep thinking. But getting to know Neil Gorsuch, listening to him regale me with stories of his experiences here was certainly one of the highlights. The other thing I spent quite a bit of time on was what we call deregulation. Um, we have an alphabet soup of agencies that uh, fix all problems, big and small. Uh, reminds me, some of you are probably too young, but there was a show, it may still be kicking around, called Yes Minister. Um, uh, that was a British show uh, about life inside some of the bureaucracies. 
in America, many of the bureaucracies have gotten a little too big and a little too powerful, and it really sometimes have lost touch with how the system is supposed to work where the people or elect the representatives. Uh, and oftentimes the unelected uh, appointed folks think they really run the show. So um, I did not really toy with any particular regulatory scheme. I, I took a, a much harder look at the regulatory state in general and took a hard look at the various judicial doctrines that have been developed over the years that give deference to the decisions of these various agency heads. Uh, a large part of the judicial selection process was tied to this effort, for example, Justice Gorsuch had a very strong opinion on something called Chevron deference. This was a Supreme Court case that, uh, where the Supreme Court announced that there would be deference given to agencies on how they construe statutes. Justice Gorsuch opined as a 10th Circuit judge that's pro that may be unconstitutional. Uh, so it sort of shows that there was a very coherent theme on the, uh, at least the first two years of the Trump presidency when it came to sort of legal theory. With that, I'll yield. I will sit down and I will now receive my, my grilling. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction. Actually, I, I wanted to start just where you left off, talking about what I think, or, or I don't want to ask you whether two of your proudest achievements, and that was um, the deregulation and the stocking of the federal courts with conservative judges, apart from the Supreme Court. I didn't really characterize it as stocking the courts with conservative judges, but <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment. Would you say that those two <laughs> things were two of your proudest achievements? Yes, yeah, particularly the, particularly the judges. It, it, it's lifetime appointment. Um, and uh, when you reach a certain age, uh, and not everyone in this room is at that age, but you reach an age where all of a sudden you're helping nominate and appoint people who are your same age or younger, it really truly becomes a lifetime appointment. Um, uh, but it's something that'll live on and I think will have an impact uh, uh, to restore a little bit more emphasis on, on uh, legal text and the meaning of text as opposed to more philosophical arguments that sometimes get passed off as legal argument. So that's, that's what I wanted to ask you about. So there's been a lot of criticism that in those appointments that actually it's just been the devolution of the, nom of the nomination process to the Federalist Society. Firstly, is that a fair assessment of the situation? And then even if it isn't, it's true that public perception is that that process is trying to artificially tilt the judicial process to the right. Do you think that has a damaging effect on civil trust in the, judi in the judicial process? Well, three separate questions. Answering in reverse order, no. Um, I don't think I don't think that I don't think it hurts. I think I think when you have people who take the law seriously and want to be involved in in voicing their opinion on who should be on the bench, I think that's helpful. Um, there are opposition reports done by other groups, people for the American Way, and a few others on all. Trump nominees about how bad they are. So there's, there's plenty of, of speech to go around and plenty of, of people weighing in on who should, who should be judges. Um, I'm a member of the Federalist Society. It was, it was uh, founded in, I guess, the late 80s, handful of folks. Justice, late Justice Nino Scalia was the faculty advisor at Chicago. David McIntosh, who was a member, of, was a member of Congress for a while, was a founder, a few other folks were founders. Um, and uh, it uh, really tried to put an emphasis on the original meaning of the U.S. Constitution and trying to restore the role of judges to reading the law as law and not as uh, social policy. Um, I was the president of my Federalist Society chapter in law school. I still actually have the little certificate they gave me. Um, virtually everyone who worked in my counsel's office were members of the Federalist Society. So. The democratic talking point that somehow it was outsourced to the Federalist Society is, I think the word you use here is rubbish. Um, uh, you know, we kind of, we kind of, we kind of insourced it, I think. Um, but I think it's a healthy thing because it also, it allowed, it allowed me to have a network of people that I've known for years uh, who I really knew took the law seriously. Oftentimes when presidents are elected, People start showing up at various groups. I mean, if a Republican wins, and lawyers you've never heard of show up at Federalist Society events to make themselves look like they're serious thinkers. And Democrats in America have the same phenomenon. Different groups, they show up and they want to look like they've been around. What the Federalist Society did for me was give me a network of people I've known for years and years and years. Current Secretary of Labor, Alex Acosta, I met him for the first time in 1995. I just moved to Washington, D.C. He had just moved to Washington, D.C. We met at the National Federalist Society Lawyers Convention. We kept in touch. President Trump needed a Secretary of Labor. I said, I know a guy, he's Secretary of Labor. 
there's a little more to be Secretary of Labor than that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the people you grow up with tend to be your peers when you get older, too. So the Federalist Society has been a, a network for me and, and my colleagues for years. So I, I don't shy away from saying that they, they're heavily involved. I'm a member, wear it proudly, and view it as a Democratic talking point to try to say that there's some weird thing afoot. Then on the second topic of regulatory rollback, I wanted to focus on a couple of um, regulatory rollbacks in particular. The first is a repeal of the Social Security Administration, um, which means that data from the Social Security Administration can no longer be used to block individuals that have potential mental health problems from buying uh, firearms. Are you proud of that repeal in particular? Well, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I have not memorized every, every rollback of every, of every reg. Those are uh, handled by the individual agencies and the White House doesn't really direct those on a day-to-day -day basis. My emphasis was more on the larger issue of the role of, of bureaucracies. Now, if a bureaucracy changes a rule with no justification, no backup in the administrative record, that's a problem and that should be able to be subject to judicial challenge. If someone's accused of doing something, for example, here's a, a better example, is, is if a veteran is attempting to get uh, benefits for post-traumatic stress disorder, this is a real case, it's going to the US Supreme Court. A uh, fellow served in Vietnam and tried to get benefits, apparently had a pretty good claim. Under the regulations of the, of the, of the Veterans Agency, the way he read the regulation, he should have won and got the benefit. The way the agency decided to read the regulation, he would not win. It went to the proper appellate court, and they said because of a case called uh, Auer, A-U-E-R, not, a, a, not O-U-R, comes from a case called Seminole Rock, that, this, that courts give deference to agencies on how they read their own regulations. So in that case, the tie went to the friendly regulator, not to the military veteran. This is the kind of thing I spend a lot of time on, these bigger issues. To me, I think that uh, at least in American law schools, first-year law students and contracts learn that you construe ambiguous terms against the drafter of the document. Not so when dealing with administrative agencies. Ty seems to go to the friendly regulator, not the private citizen. I kind of think that's wrong. Supreme Court's going to decide that issue, but those, those are more of the issues I, I kind of uh, focused on. Particular regulatory actions, those, those come and go, and there's a process. If people feel aggrieved, they can challenge it in court and that sort of thing. Did any of the particular appeals sit uncomfortably with you, personally? Well, the thing about administrative law, it takes years. So we inherited a number of things I was very uncomfortable with uh, and spent, uh, my office spent quite a bit of time working with the Department of Justice to try to rectify. There were a number of lawsuits, for example, uh, from religious institutions. Uh, Catholic universities and the like over what we shorthand as the contraceptive mandate. This was a something that came about from the uh, uh, what we colloquial call Obamacare, a name that he actually embraced at the end of his presidency, uh, where through regulation um, it was promulgated that you had to provide contraceptive coverage as part of your insurance package. Um, if you're a Catholic institution where you don't believe contraception should be provided. That's a violation of your faith. The government has tried to compel a number of places to do that, and there are a number of lawsuits and that sort of thing, and, and a lot of that did not get settled. President Trump came in, a lot of that got resolved to the satisfaction of all parties. So those are the kind of things I'm, I'm proud of. And that's an example of an agency doing something that's not in a statute, not passed by an elected representative, not the sort of thing that the elected representatives can get the votes to pass, but just did by administrative fiat. So were there any repeals of the Trump administration attempted that sat personally uncomfortably with you? None come to mind. I mean, the big ones I probably, probably support. Like getting out of the Paris thing. I was, yeah, I was all for that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will come on to that in a bit. Um, then moving on to a slightly different topic altogether. I'm just baiting the, you know. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, with Audience the perks up, yeah. <laughs> with the Mueller inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, so you cooperated at length with the investigators at the direction of President Trump, but you surely know that it's unorthodox for a lawyer to be so forthcoming with an investigation, especially when shielded by potential client attorney privilege or um, even executive privilege. So what were your initial thoughts when the president allowed you to speak so freely with the investigators? Well, out of respect for Mr. Mueller and what he's doing, I'm not really going to comment on nitty gritty about what I thought when. Uh, you know, I, I believe in the rule of law and the process uh, and... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's right to sort of publicly say. 
what I can say generally, though, is that, um, uh, and I probably should have mentioned this in, the, in my opening salvo, um, there's attorney-client privilege lawyers have with private clients, and that's, that's usually absolute. There's a couple exceptions here and there, but generally when you speak to your lawyer, it's considered to be protected and not admissible against you. When you work for the U.S. government, it's a little bit different. Different doctrines apply, and the U.S. courts have, have indicated that the attorney-client privilege is not quite as absolute. And part of this is, uh, turns on the question of who's the client. Because you represent the president as president, uh, those things obviously should be privileged, but what if there's other discussions that aren't really in his capacity as president? Like this had come up in the past. Uh, John Dean had testified before Congress uh, against President Nixon. Uh, a couple different lawyers who worked for President Clinton in the White House had to appear before grand juries. That was actually uh, decided by case law. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, the sort of circuit that sits in D.C., uh, decided a uh, uh, seminal case there. So uh, there's also executive privilege. This sounds in the Constitution, uh, where the president needs candid advice from his close advisors. Um, Mr. Mueller is part of the executive branch, so it's, it's not an inner branch uh, dispute at this point. Uh, time will tell uh, how this plays out. But it's a very complicated issue with a mixture of constitutional law, case law, legal theory. Um, and uh, when one is, is the lawyer at the time of something, usually the prudent course is not to also uh, be the lawyer for yourself. So uh, what I will say is I'm, I'm always one to suggest that uh, an a elected official ensure they have a personal attorney that they have a, the correct government attorney, uh, maybe a second government attorney who's a, what we call kind of a clean team who is not part of the underlying contact, conduct. Um, and that's, that's eventually what, what the White House did. Emmett Flood is currently playing that role, uh, who I think is a, a, you know, a fantastic lawyer. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of Mueller, but it's a complicated issue, the role of the lawyer, and, and it really t a lot of it turns on who is the client and privilege and all that sort of thing. So on, on that point, you said in your opening speech that you saw yourself as the counsel for the pictures on the wall. Without getting into nitty gritty, do you think that the president wrongfully expected you to act as his personal attorney at the I start? Don't, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. President Trump's a businessman. He doesn't come out of the political world, uh, which is something that I think a lot of voters found appealing. He also did not come out of the uh, corporate Wall Street board of directors share shareholder world. He was his own guy uh, and uh, is used to doing things his way and has been very effective doing him things his way. Uh, quite unorthodox. Uh, but he seems to, you, you know, it, it, when, he, when he does things his way, it, it, remarkable how early on many people say that's, that's not going to work, and then it, it, turns to, it tends to work out. So um, I saw it as my challenge to, 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 to make sure he understood the, the difference. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not something you instinctively think of if, you're, if you haven't been in government and, and been, been in elected office before. So, but... Then at any point, did you fear that the president was trying to set you up to take the blame for any legal obstruction? Uh, there's been news speculation about that. I'll just let it stay at, stay at that. I, you know, again, I just as respect for the process, well, it's not, it's not meant to imply one thing e either way. Um, you know, I, I did my best for the president every day, and I think the president did, did, did by me great every day as well. Uh, so I think uh, between me and him, everything is... is uh, I did my job, he did his job. What others have said to the press, what others, other hidden agendas other staff may have had, and whatever the media is speculating, we'll, we'll just leave it at media reports for that, for now. Then moving on to a slightly different topic, I want to look ahead to the 2020 race. Considering that only a few hours ago it was reported that the House Judiciary Chairman has hired two legal consultants who've openly advocated for the impeachment of President Trump or the possible indictment of the President for obstructing justice, do you think there's any possibility that President Trump won't be on the ballot in 2020? Is there any chance? Always a chance. World could end, right? There's always some metaphysical, <laughs> always some metaphysical chance, right? Uh, you know, as a, as a pragmatic, you know, as a real answer, no. Um, um, he'll be on the ballot. He's seeking re-election. Uh, you know, it's an interesting dynamic politically, if I can just delve into politics for a moment, on, on how the Democrats, the opposition party, is going to play this. Um, are they going to hang back and, and, and let it evolve, or are they going to try to lead from the front and start talking impeachment? You hear both messages coming out of the Democratic caucus. Some are saying 
impeach with some expletives. Um, others who have been a little more seasoned and been around are taking a more cautious role and letting it unfold. You know, there's some opportunities right now um, where some things could actually get done. I think the President's State of the Union laid out a roadmap for that. And I think the House Democrats have a choice. Are they going to actually try to legislate? There's been talk of doing kind of an infrastructure bill. A number of America's roads are kind of crumbling. There has not been a real reboot of the highway system in a long time. There's been a lot of talk about doing it. Ordinarily, it's the Democrats who, who are keen on spending the money. The Republicans say, hold on. President Trump said he's willing to, to work a deal on that. Do they do, they do that sort of thing? Um, do they actually try to figure out um, a way to, to strengthen, harmonize, otherwise make more consistent with prior precedent like immigration laws? Or are they going to talk impeachment and do kind of sideshows? We'll see. Um, I was in Washington in the 1990s when the shoe was on the other foot. Uh, a number of more seasoned Democratic consultants have expressed caution on the, you know, impeach at all costs approach. The House Republicans did this. Um, I was younger then, but before the 1998 off-year election, uh, they, they thought, the Republicans thought that this was really going to be great. They're going to impeach Clinton and... and and even if he doesn't get convicted in the Senate, it would mean that they'd do great in the election and they almost lost the House and it really backfired on them. So um, it's, a, it's a complicated political calculus to do it. Impeachment is a very, is a very blunt instrument uh, to be used only for high crimes and misdemeanors, which is not a term that really means whatever the House thinks it means. There's a history there as to what that means. So I, I think, I think um, if I were advising Democrats, I'd be very cautious, and I'd think about I'd think about using this as an opportunity to maybe get some get some political wins uh, of things that they they might not be able to otherwise get, but for but for a unique situation where you have a majority in the House that's Democrat, Senate Republican majority, and then a Republican president who's not cut from the traditional Republican mold. Then my final question before we open. Uh stuff out to the audience, is that based on your knowledge of what a Trump campaign looks like from the 2016 campaign, who do you think President Trump would be most concerned about? Were they likely to win the Democratic ticket for a 2020 race? Well, that would be telling, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tell all my secrets. Um, I think one has, to, one has to take a hard look at how, how President Trump won. Uh, which then requires a step back to look at the current state of American politics. When I, uh, when I left the Federal Election Commission several years ago, I guess that was 2013, I did an inter interview with a magazine and I, I, I said that the, the two-party system in America was de-aligning. The two parties were, their traditional bases were sort of decoupling from their usual thing. Um, the conventional wisdom was you had a certain percentage of Republicans who were going to vote Republican no matter what, a certain percentage who were going to vote Democratic no matter what, and the others were so-called independents, but they really trended one way or the other. And, and what you saw over the past several years was the fruition of that, where the parties have decoupled. And you really had a situation in 2016 where someone who ran as a traditional Republican on the traditional issue set that would get Republicans elected to the White House could not win the White House again. Same is really true of the Democratic Party. If they run uh, their traditional to their base, so to speak, there's not enough Americans who are going to vote for that. So the reason why President Trump won was he saw this and he spoke to people who felt kind of left out, people who felt left behind, people who felt that, um, you know, the, the sort of modern economy was not being kind to what they had done for a living for years and the like. Um, so any, any, any campaign uh, that can figure that out and do it with some sort of authenticity uh, is going to be formidable. The question is who can do it with authenticity? That's a challenge right now for the Democrats because they all have their own, uh, uh, you know, own track record of things that you know, to potentially get in the way of, of sort of being all men to all people. Um, the Democratic primary will be very interesting. I think they will, they will make uh, uh, further left-moving claims to win primary votes, could make them unelectable in the general election. Um, 
that stand, tends to be the conventional wisdom. So it's, uh, it's wide open on the Democratic side, but it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be in a lot of ways the mirror image of the 2016 pre presidential uh, primary fight on the Republican side. You're gonna have a number of candidates all speaking to different aspects of the Democratic Party and all trying to sort of realign a, coali a governing coalition that can uh, get enough votes to win. Not an easy challenge for anyone. Right, well on that, let's open up questions to the audience. If you want to put up your hand, wait for the microphone to be brought to you, but stand up when you do. Uh, yeah, let's go to the hand in the very back in the aisle. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much for coming here to talk to us. So my question is, uh, how, what is your opinion on the possibility that the president can be charged with a crime, uh, perhaps through the Mueller investigation, through a special counsel, or is articles of impeachment the only uh, way for that to happen? Or is, is it only a political uh, process? An addendum to that would be, um, would you see, a, oh, sorry, I blanked out on the addendum. That's on right. the, it's the, a, the, your first the, question is tough enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the second part was about the possibility of an impeachment and what would be the outcomes that Trump might make out of that. Thank you. Sure. Um, let me deal with the first one a little bit in, 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 in a little bit of detail. Um, the Department of Justice's view for many, many decades, regardless of whether Republicans in the White House or Democrats in the White House, is that a sitting president cannot be indicted uh, for a federal crime. The logic of this uh, is, is rather basic. Um, there's three branches of government under the Constitution. The executive power comes from Article II, that's the president. The Department of Justice is housed in the executive branch, so it doesn't make a lot of sense that the executive branch can indict itself. I've over, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's the basic syllogism of how DOJ ends up where they end up. They also make clear once a president leaves, however, as a private citizen, then uh, any criminal punishment could, could, could attach. As I said before, out of respect to Mr. Mueller in the process, I'm not going to get into any, any particular details here, uh, but there is scholarship on this uh, on both sides. Um, and I think, I think the majority view is that uh, impeachment is the mechanism where uh, a, a officer of the U.S. would have to be removed and then, and then pursued. It can't be done in, in, in some other order. Um, impeachment is, a, as I said, it's a big stick. It's only happened a few times uh, and uh, never to conviction. Um, when someone is impeached, that just means the House has voted to impeach, which is majority. To be removed, it has to be convicted in the Senate uh, by a supermajority, uh, presided over by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in a full trial. We saw this, Bill Clinton went through this in the late 90s uh, and, and was not convicted in the Senate. So. Um, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating issue if you're looking for an article to write and for scholarship. It's, it's uh, not the sort of issue one can glibly discuss here uh, in, in a short time period, but I appreciate the question. And then, yeah, let's come to the hand to raise back. Mr. McGann, thank you for being here. Uh, so Jay Sekulow and John Dowd reportedly both said that Trump would be unable to sit for an interview with Mueller because he's a pathological liar and perjure himself. Uh, given your relationship as at least some form of legal counsel to President Trump, how do you think he would fare in an in in-person interview with a special counsel? And if your answer is some variation of not well, how concerned should that make the American people? Well, I, I can't. You know, I, I can't really speak to what Mr. Dow and Mr. Sekulow allegedly said to a reporter who wrote a book, and I, you know, I'm not going to comment on media reports. What I can say is, um, you know, President Trump, he's been in business his whole life. He's been in litigation his whole life. He's sat for many depositions over the years. So, you know, he's, he, he got to be President of the United States because he knew, he knew what he was doing in some, in some form. So... You know, it's not really my job as an attorney to speculate as to how he would do or not do. Um, you know, the, the thing about investigation speaking generally is you never know everything until it's completed. So it's really impossible to say how, how anything will play out, uh, setting aside the, the gist of your question. But I, I just, 
respectfully, I'm not going to take the bait and get into it. What I'm going to say, the president has, he has sat for depositions and interviews for his whole career, and he is now the president of the United States. That's the van two rows behind. Or the row behind, yeah. You, sir, you, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, coming tonight, Ms. Mega. Very interesting. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to see Matthew Whitaker's uh, testimony to Congress last week. I did. I'm not sure why I watched it, but I couldn't turn it off. Um, but uh, there was a, a moment where a Republican member of the committee uh, gave Matthew Whitaker the advice that before taking the advice of a career civil servant at the Department of Justice, he should determine if they're loyal, quote, to the Attorney General and to the President. I just wonder if you could comment on that Say point that of view. again. Well, I, 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 said, didn't, I didn't watch his, his testimony. Yeah, so. he basically said, you know, I, I, Matthew Whitaker has been criticized, I think, for not listening to the advice of career civil servants in the Department of Justice on ethics matters, other, other matters like that, right? Um, the myth of the career civil servant who's just... Uh, the myth of the career civil servant just honestly calling the balls and strikes, but continue. Yeah. Well, it'll be an interesting part of your answer, I think. But uh, the congressman's uh, advice to him was that before he took the advice of, of lawyers in the Department of Justice, he should determine if they were loyal, quote, to the attorney general and to the president. Uh, and I'm interested in your perspective on that. Is that the perspective that we should have? Is that a point that reasonable people can disagree on, or is it... I, you know, I didn't, I didn't watch it. I don't know what the congressman was getting at. Um, you know, with all due respect to our congressman, sometimes when the TV cameras are on, they, they sometimes do things for dramatic effect. I'm sure that never happens in the British Parliament. <laughs> um, but the, the, I, there's, there's a kernel of truth in it because ultimately it's Whitaker's decision as to whether he would have to recuse and what ethics approach he would take. And, and he's the one that's accountable. He's the one that the president appointed as the acting attorney general. The career civil servants, the faceless folks that oftentimes get branded about as the arbiters of truth, um, they're not the ones ultimately accountable. They're not the ones appointed by the elected officials. So I, I'm of the view of, of the, the people speak through their elected representatives and elected representatives appoint people they can take guidance from the career people, but ultimately it's the person appointed that has to make the call and they can't hide one way or another behind career officials. Let's move over to the hand to my left. Thank you for speaking with us tonight. Um, I was just wondering if um, in light of the current uh, ruling on the Louisiana abortion cases that um, Chief Justice Roberts just kind of unexpectedly came on the left side. What you think of bipartisan politics seeping into the um, Supreme Court in a traditionally nonpartisan branch of government? There's two issues there. One, the reality of is it a partisan court and has it crept into decision making? And two, the public view of the court. This dovetails off of uh, a question earlier about uh, the role of the Federalist Society. What does the public think about that and that sort of thing? Um, I, think, I think Chief Justice Roberts is trying very, very hard to be an institutionalist. And that's always uh, something that I think every Chief Justice had tried to do. I remember seeing a speech that Justice Scalia gave he uh, about uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist's tenure. And he talked about how he used the word shin kicker. How, how Justice Rehnquist was, was very strident in his opinions. Once he became Chief Justice, he sort of moderated a little bit um, uh, and became more of an institutionalist. Whether that's true or not, I leave to others to decide. Um, but I think Roberts is, is uh, on the one hand, trying to be an institutionalist uh, and uh, try to stay above the fray. Whether it's successful, I think history will, will, will tell us. As far as that particular case, um, the media sensationalizes many, many things, including Supreme Court rulings that are not on the final merits of the case. Uh, that's a case regarding a Louisiana law uh, that requires uh, doctors who perform abortions to have admission privileges to hospitals. Uh, there were some gruesome examples in the United States of doctors that didn't have admissions privileges and causing harm to everyone involved. Um, 
So a number of states have passed these laws. Some, some uh, lower courts have determined are an undue burden to what the Supreme Court recognized in Roe versus Wade, later in Planned, Par Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, as a constitutional right and an undue burden on that right. Um, and it's now an issue that's really in the courts. Uh, and the Louisiana case is the latest. There was a Texas case from 2016 that went to the Supreme Court, Whole Women's Health. Factual record is radically different in the two cases. So the Louisiana situation is, is actually quite a bit different. Um, the district court there stayed the law. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals said, no, the law can, be, can go forward. It went to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, the liberal judges, justices, let's assume we kind of know where they are in the issue. Uh, Roberts being the institutionalist, he doesn't really like cases, and this is me playing sort of armchair quarterback of how the Supreme Court thinks, so take this for a grain of salt, but there's a, there's a game in Washington, D.C. called you don't have to be the best lawyer, you just have to know how to count to five. So there's this power game of trying to guess what the Supreme Court would do. Um, you know, Roberts does not like cases that disturb injunctions or interfere with regular process. Uh, and... Uh, We'll see how the case plays out on the merits. It's not over. It's going back down to the lower courts. It'll probably come back up to the Supreme Court. Um, Justice Kavanaugh issued a short dissent, uh, uh, which was merely agreeing with where the Fifth Circuit was. His point was that the law, for the most part, really didn't go into effect for another 45 days. And there looked like there could be a good chance that all these doctors in Louisiana could get admissions privileges. And if they did, then there's no burden and there doesn't seem to be much of a case. So. Um, it's an interesting one. It's, it's been an issue that has plagued our courts for uh, decades, really, since Roe was first decided, and uh, it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Um, it's unfortunate that the court gets portrayed as sort of a partisan court on the issue, though. Uh, I think what you see is, you know, serious, serious grappling with the issue that's not necessarily partisan. That's, that's how I view the court. Uh, I think uh, it goes more to how one reads the Constitution, enumerated rights versus implied rights or penumbra rights or other rights that have been posited by the court. Uh, so I think there's more going on than just a partisan thing. It's unfortunate, though, that people see the court occasionally as partisan. But, uh, you know, e example uh, of trying to be above the fray, um, the uh, Federalist Society had their annual gala end of last year. Uh, and Justice Kavanaugh declined being the keynote speaker. He decided, he, he went, a bunch of justices go, uh, but he decided not to be the speaker. So I ended up doing a Q&A, not unlike this with Senator McConnell, uh, which was entertaining for, for me. Um, uh, no one else seemed to enjoy it as much as I did. But uh, it, uh, you know, it, it, and that was a, a symbolic gesture of Justice Kavanaugh trying to move, you know, try to get, you know, let the public know he was, Joining, he would call it a team of nine. It was one of his things. He saw himself joining a team of nine, not a block of three or four or five. So I think that kind of talk, I think, gives confidence that the court's trying to, trying to get it right. Yeah, let's go to the hand just two rows behind. Thank you for your talk. I was curious about your perspective on the unitary executive theory and specifically how it relates to whether the president could or should fire the special counsel. Well, it's not a theory. It's grounded in the text of the Constitution. Um, you know, the, the executive power is, is vested in the, in the president. Um, you know, there's, there's two issues. One, what the president can do legally, uh, and then what should he do in a mixture of legal norm and politics. By legal norm, I mean these things that have sort of developed over time in polite Washington, D.C. of do's and don'ts that aren't really found in the Constitution or a statute, but become kind of guardrails uh, to avoid going into areas that cross lines. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was a, a, uh, a big fan of um, Attorney General Ed Meese, uh, it was uh, President Reagan's uh, second attorney general. And uh, he developed quite a bit of work on the idea of a unitary executive, and to me it rings true. Um, as far as whether, how deep into the executive branch the president can you know, fire people and that kind of thing. Uh, again, there's scholarship on that, but uh, he certainly does have the authority to, to fire a number of people. There are cases that preclude him from firing certain people. There's a case called Humphrey's Executor 
that was handed down uh, years and years and years ago. The, the, uh, Humphreys was the head of the Federal Trade Con Commission. Uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, didn't agree with how he was running the Federal Trade Commission, tried to fire him. Uh, he challenged it. He passed away, hence, hence the case Humphreys' executor took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that in that case, uh, he shouldn't have been fired. He was in, his estate was entitled to basically back pay and benefits. Obviously, he couldn't, he couldn't be put back in charge of the Federal Trade Commission at that point. So there are, the Supreme Court has limited, um, which gets to the, is there any chance? You know, there's always a chance uh, that something may change. But uh, it gets in, there are limits on the president's authority. But again, that's a, that's a very complicated subject. Uh, the president's made clear repeatedly, though, he's not interested in firing Bob Mueller or anything of, of the sort. He said that publicly a number of times, and the only people that seem to be talking about firing him are the House Democrats currently. Uh, so that's my glib, that's my glib political response to what was uh, an attempt at a more sophisticated uh, uh, discussion. Um, yeah, let's get a hand on the aisle. Um, so speaking of Senator McConnell, um, Given your uh, deference to the rule of law, um, procedural norms, do you not believe that President Obama should have been able to appoint a justice to the seat that Gorsuch now occupies? And if the situation were reversed and Harry Reid or Chuck Schumer played the same strategy, would you really just call it par for the course? It'd be tough for Harry Reid to do it because he's no longer in the Senate. But I do owe Harry Reid a big round of applause because he actually blew up the filibuster. Uh, and was the one primarily responsible for kind of where we are. Um, there is precedent for what happened with the vacancy uh, uh, left by the untimely death of Justice Scalia. Uh, Joe Biden did the same thing when he was running the show in the Senate <coughs> Judiciary Committee. Um, at the end of the day, the Constitution gives the power to put people on the Supreme Court to the President and the Senate. It's not a situation where the U.S. House can chime in or there's judicial review or that sort of thing. The remedy for something that goes wrong on the uh, confirmation process is the ballot box. If people don't like it, they can vote their conscience. Um, there's, there was an intervening election since the vacancy occurred for president. There's been two intervening elections for Senate since the vacancy occurred. So we are now at a state where the people have had an opportunity to speak not once but twice. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of these things, the confirmation process is, is uh, it, it ends up being a tension between two branches of government. Politics plays a role. Law plays a role. There's a lot of things going on and, uh, you know, it's, it's, this is, it's, it's not new. Let's go to the hand in the middle. Hi. Um, so in the 90s, in the Clinton White House, there was an entire different structure set up within the council's office to deal with all the investigations. It had its own communication structure, and that's largely credited with Bill Clinton being able to maintain high polling numbers. So I was just curious why you decided not to set up sort of an analogous structure while you were council, and if you think that had you done that, if results would have been different. Well, uh Results denotes finality. I think the history is still unfolding. Um, let's keep let, let's let's just let's review the arc of the Clinton years. Um, the the separate structure that they put in place didn't really happen until the mid to late '90s, really second term. Um, Lanny Davis went to the White House and became special counsel, and kind of ran the the clean team unit with separate press team and that sort of thing. Um, little known fact, I, I started my career at a firm called Patton Boggs and I worked for a number of different partners, but one in particular was named Lanny Davis. Uh, and I actually was working with Lanny at the time he was hired by President Clinton to go, uh, so, uh, go become his uh, lawyer for the, uh, uh, inside the White House. So I paid particular attention to how that was, was set up. Early in the Clinton years, they didn't do that. They, they actually tried to just do it themselves and didn't sub, set up any, of a, any sort of clean team. This White House did set up a clean team. It wasn't, there wasn't a separate comms operation per se and, and pure separateness in other aspects, but legally, um, 
the president brought in a fellow named Ty Cobb to be special counsel, which is essentially my equivalent for purposes of the role of the office. Uh, so actually, there was a clean team brought in. It didn't, it didn't quite have the public persona. Now, as, as the next two years evolve, I think the ball is in the court of the House Democrats and see how much oversight they're going to do and how much press there's going to be. Um, the final thing, and this is more of an academic point, is when the Clinton team, the real separateness was set up, everything that was being discussed at that point were things that happened while President Clinton were, was president. Um, many of the things that were bandished about and still are being bandished about in the press regarding President Trump have absolutely nothing to do with him as president. It may have to do with things on the campaign or they're talking about his businesses and all this other stuff, which really has nothing to do with his role as president. The Clinton years were, were uh, uh, scandal after scandal that dealt with things that actually happened in the government. So that's a distinguishing fact, I think, that separates the two. Um, but, you know, there's different ways historically how to set these up and defend these. That's a whole, that's a whole other lecture in and of itself. It's more for a, a law school class. But, um, you know, time, time will tell if people made the right moves at the right time. Yeah, let's jump to the hand in the second row. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting to hear about um, the sort of intricate um, process, process of decision making in the White House and the role of um, your, your role in the White House previously as well. Um, when, Dan, when Dan asked you about um, sort of decisions that President Trump made that you might potentially be uncomfortable with, you mentioned, um, if I heard correctly, that you said you were, you were, very f you were fully supporting the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. I was wondering if that decision was a personal one or is that a technical one as well? I really try to not have personal views, particularly as a lawyer. I tell this to young lawyers all the time. You're supposed to represent the client and the client's interests, so you're not really supposed to be doing your own thing. But I'm a lifelong Republican and work for Republicans, so you know, I tend to believe in, in the Republican stuff. Um, uh, legally, the Paris uh, Agreement was, was odd, to say the least. Um, it looked a lot like a treaty under the U.S. Constitution that should have went through the U.S. Senate. President Obama didn't put it through the U.S. Senate. A number of senators criticized that, mostly on the Republican side. Ted Cruz was very vocal on this, for example. Um, the international law folks then would say in the same breath it was a treaty for purposes of international law. Um, and that's a, that was an interesting uh, two-step that I, that I, I learned uh, that they, they tried to, to justify it. Um, it didn't really have a lot of binding effect. It had a lot of goals. It wasn't clear on how it really affected other nations. Um, so legally, the thing was, 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 was suboptimal, I think we'll call it. Um, aspirational international agreement to be made someday in the future, perhaps, is what it really was. I don't know. Um, but it was certainly something that uh, could cause some problems in U.S. domestic law because what had happened was the Environmental Protection Agency had used the framework of the Paris Agreement in a, in a number of rulemakings and tried to bake it into domestic law without a specific grant of statutory authority from the Congress, without a specific grant of authority from a treaty ratified by the U.S. Senate. So I saw it as a lawyer as a way to backdoor in law that was never really passed as law. So I saw it as, as really one of the first fights in the role of the elected versus the unelected and who makes the laws in America, aside from the environmental issues and that kind of thing. I try to not get into um, uh, those sorts of issues. And as counsel, I really didn't get into policy disputes, even on the regulatory things and why I really didn't take the bait on the early question about this reg and that reg, that wasn't my job as counsel. I, I've, I've said this in other contexts. If, if, the, if the Occupational Safe and Healthy Health Agency says you need a 15-foot fence around a construction site instead of a 10-foot fence for safety reasons, I don't really know the difference. That's not my specialty. What I do know, though, is that they just imposed the 15-foot requirement without putting it out for notice and comment out under the Administrative Procedures Act. If they just change the requirement without let, out letting the, the public have an opportunity to be heard, if they do it without some kind of due process, that's where the problem comes in for a lawyer, I think. So I stayed out of policy fights. I tried to be 
as best I could the honest broker and try to assess the legal framework for what, what, the, what the answer was legally and then let the policy makers advise, uh, policy advisors advise the president on what the policy, he's the president, right? He makes the policy choice. I just, I just try to be in the rear with the gear trying to do the law. But there were significant, in my view, significant legal problems with the Paris issue. And I think we've got time for two more questions. So let's jump to the hand in the far back corner. Saving the best for last. Thank you, Mr. McGann, for your talk tonight. I just wanted to ask your thoughts on the extent to which the president's inherent executive powers extended. Uh, obviously, this has relevance for the kind of nascent question as to whether or not the president has the capacity to use his executive power to uh, build the wall, so to speak. Yeah. Less important is the, is the building of the there wall. There is some statutory land. authority for that, though. There actually is. I mean, Congress actually has put in this emergency power and statute, and they can. Oh, there's been a couple articles on this. They can actually overrule it with a vote. So the Congress has recognized the emergency power concept the president's talking about. Okay. So in, in that in that case, if right. it's not a matter of executive of inherent executive power, but statutory delegated power, uh, do you think that the characterization of what's happening at the wall could fit that statutory definition of emergency under that act? Oh, it could. Sure. Now, whether it's a good idea. I'm not the president. I mean, if the president thinks it's a good idea, then that's his decision to make. Um, just talking the legal framework, he has the authority to do quite a bit. Um, two ways. One is, is executive branch authority under the Constitution. Two is statutory power. Let me break that down a little bit in a more general way to avoid kind of the hot button of the wall. I try to keep this, I'm trying to match the you know, elegance of the room here and stay above current events. Um, there, over the past several decades, Oh, maybe 50 years. There's been a trend where Congress has passed statutes in areas that really are executive power, executive branch functions, and they do it in a way to try to put, give some structure to the executive. And rarely are these really tested in court because no one really wants to go all in and see what the confines are uh, of each branch's power because it's in each branch's hour, it's in each branch's power to kind of just keep it. So there's a little bit of tension, right? Makes it interesting, if nothing else. Um, so there's these statutes that sort of recognize that the executive has some power, but then they try to limit it. And some of these executive emergency powers are of that sort. Um, that does not diminish the inherent power of the executive. Look, the Article I of the U.S. Constitution that creates the House and Senate is one of enumerated powers. It goes through an excruciating detail, detail what, they, what, they, what they're empowered to do. Uh, you know, commerce, copyrights, that sort of thing, right? It goes through, uh, declare war, uh, but yet the president's commander in chief. There's a whole, right, you can write volumes on, on how that power is shared. Um, executive branch power is not an enumerated power. It's an executive power, whatever that may mean. And one, one needs to really go back to the founding of the country and realize why the Revolutionary War was fought, why the Articles of Confederation worked in some ways but failed miserably in others, why the executive was created the way the executive was created, to really get a sense of those executive powers. But they're certainly there. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's awkward for me because I've spent most of my career representing legislative branch members, members of the House and Senate. I was the outside counsel to the Committee on House Administration in the, for, for a few Congresses. Once upon a time, so I, I am much more wired. I, I, I much more wired as what I call an Article One person, someone who views congressional power. You know, Article One is one for a reason. It's kind of supreme, but that's really not true. They're co-equal branches. So I, I uh, then then was found uh, found myself representing Article Two, um, but having seen it, you know, I've, I've I've worked both sides of the street, so to speak, on the issue, and I, I'm of the school of thought that that the branches are designed to clash from time to time. And that's actually a healthy thing. That's not something to fear. That's how it's supposed to be. And then the voters can, can decide, in some instances, who has, the better, who has the better argument. Sometimes it goes to the courts. Sometimes it's just fought to a draw and the branches have to duke it out. Congress has tremendous power. The power of the purse is a tremendous power. So the president, without money, it gets tricky. 
but that's a very big stick that Congress rarely uses. You know, there was a, there was a movie about a fellow named Charlie Wilson, who was a member of Congress from Texas. Charlie Wilson's War was, there was a book and then a movie. And, and he, he, was, he was not afraid to zero out the budgets of certain parts of the, of, of the Pentagon and CIA to, to, make his, to make his point. Very few people really have the courage to, to zero out parts of the executive branch. And that's a kind of an extreme thing. But my, you know, I, I come from the school of thought where the system of government is set up to have these sorts of clashes between the branches. And I think it's healthy. And I think it's healthy for the president to say, hey, I, I do have power to do this. And that forces the Congress to maybe come to the table and try to come up with a solution. And then Congress say, we don't think you have that much power. That forces the president to come to the table and try to come up with a solution. I think that's how the system is designed. And I think that's actually, that's, that's a that feature, not a bug. And then we've got time for one final question. So yeah, let's go to the hand just in front of you, Ollie. Yeah. Good to end things on a lighter note. I think it's pretty cool that you got to work in the White House as an American. So I'm just curious, what's your funniest anecdotal story from your time there? My fondest anecdotal story. Funniest. What, what was that? Funniest. Funniest. It was a laugh a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were some funny times. I mean, it's serious work. You know, it's, it's and I, I, I've spent my whole professional career in Washington, D.C. around you know, white buildings made of alabaster stone. You know, I, 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 I really have come to appreciate the institutions of, of DC. So every day I got to walk in there was a special day, even if it wasn't a funny day. Um, you know, the, the, I don't know if it's funny, but the, the, one, of the, one of the nice parts of the job is you get to, there's a handful of senior staff that kind of have all access privileges. Um, uh, there's like walk-in privileges to the Oval Office, that sort of thing, and you can you can kind of give private tours. So I was able to give private tours to different people I've known over the years, some people I knew from high school, you know, and it's it's kind of a cool thing. Like you, you know, I'm, I kind of made something of myself. I can take you in the Oval Office, rock stars, celebrities, people like that to meet to meet people, um, uh, and and give tours. It was kind of nice. It made me, you know, it it reminded me of 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 uh, the reason why, why it's a special place. That's not a funny story. I mean, there, there's a lot of funny stories I can't tell you because, you know, <laughs> and then I'd have to kill you. Um, <laughs> or the CIA would come find you or something. But, um, uh, you know, it was bringing in people who were not part of the day-to-day, -day, who had never really been in, in there and it, had not seen it. And to see their look in the eye that, you know, you walk up to the Oval Office and they get the velvet rope and they're doing, you know, walk through tours. But, you know, I was, I rated the ability just to take the rope down and say, go on in and to see people's look. I, I had one fella actually start to tear up. Um, and his father um, worked for President Reagan, not in the White House, but, a, 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 you know, more of a, a distant role. So he grew up in, the, in that world. And, and to give a fella like that a tour, and he, I mean, he really appreciated the history of the place. So I wish I could be funnier, but Oxford's not a funny place, so I'm, I'm going to try to keep it solemn. Thank you for your answer. Well, that's a nice note to end on. Um, so unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But please do join with me in thanking Don McGowan.